Hello friends, and welcome to the fourth installment in this calm reading of the Count of Monte Cristo. Today we will be listening to chapter 6 and 7, the Deputy Procureur du Roi, and the Examination. Let us begin. Chapter 6 The Deputy Procureur du Roi In one of the aristocratic mansions built by Puget in the Rue du Grand Cour, opposite the Medusa Fountain, a second marriage feast was being celebrated. Almost at the same hour with the nuptial repast given by Dante. In this case, however, Although the occasion of the entertainment was similar, the company was strikingly dissimilar. Instead of a rude mixture of sailors, soldiers, and those belonging to the humblest grade of life, the present assembly was composed of the very flower of Marseille society. Magistrates who had resigned their office during the usurper's reign Officers who had deserted from the imperial army and joined forces with Condé, and younger members of families, brought up to hate and execrate the man whom five years of exile would convert into a martyr, and fifteen of restoration elevate to the rank of a god. The guests were still at table and the heated and energetic conversation that prevailed betrayed the violent and vindictive passions that then agitated each dweller of the South. Where, unhappily, for five centuries religious strife had long given increased bitterness to the violence of party feeling. The emperor, now king of the petty island of Elba, after having held sovereign sway over one half of the world, counting as his subjects a small population of five or six thousand souls, after having been accustomed to hear the vive Napoleon of a hundred and twenty millions of human beings, uttered in ten different languages, was looked upon here as a ruined man, separated for ever from any fresh connection with France or claim to her throne. The magistrates freely discussed their political views. The military part of the company talked unreservedly of Moscow and Leipzig, while the women commented on the divorce of Josephine. It was not over the downfall of the man, but over the defeat of the Napoleonic idea that they rejoiced, and in this they foresaw for themselves the bright and cheering prospect of a revivified political existence. An old man, decorated with the cross of St. Louis, now rose and proposed the health of King Louis the Eighteenth. It was the Marquise de saint Meran. This toast recalling at once the patient exile of Hartwell and the peace-loving king of France, excited universal enthusiasm. Glasses were elevated in the air à l'anglais, and the ladies, snatching their bouquets from their fair bosoms, strewed the table with their floral treasures. In a word, an almost poetical fervor prevailed. Ah said the Marquise de saint Meran, a woman with a stern, forbidding eye, though still noble and distinguished in appearance, despite her fifty years. Ah, these revolutionists, who have driven us from those very possessions they afterwards purchased for a mere trifle, during the reign of terror, would be compelled to own, were they here, that all true devotion was on our side, since we were content to follow the fortunes of a falling monarch, while they, on the contrary, 
made their fortune by worshipping the rising sun. Yes, yes, they could not help admitting that the king, for whom we sacrificed rank, wealth, and station, was truly our Louis the Well-Beloved. While their wretched usurper has been, and ever will be, to them their evil genius, their Napoleon the accursed, am I not right, before? I beg your pardon, madame, I really must pray you to excuse me, but, in truth, I was not attending to the conversation. Marquise, Marquise, interposed the old nobleman who had proposed the toast. Let the young people alone. Let me tell you, on one's wedding day, there are more agreeable subjects of conversation than dry politics. Never mind, dearest mother, said a young and lovely girl with a profusion of light brown hair and eyes that seemed to float in liquid crystal. Tis all my fault for sizing up Monsieur de Villefort, so as to prevent his listening to what you said. But there, now take him. He is your own for as long as you like. Monsieur Villefort, I beg to remind you my mother speaks to you. If the Marquise will deign to repeat the words I but imperfectly caught, I shall be delighted to answer, said Monsieur de Villefort. Never mind, René, replied the Marquise, with a look of tenderness that seemed out of keeping with her harsh, dry features. But, however all other feelings may be withered in a woman's nature, there is always one bright, smiling spot in the desert of her heart. And that is the shrine of maternal love. I forgive you. What I was saying, Villefort, was that the Bonapartists had not our sincerity, enthusiasm, or devotion. They had, however, what supplied the place of those fine qualities, replied the young man, and that was fanaticism. Napoleon is the Mahomet of the West, and is worshipped by his commonplace but ambitious followers not only as a leader and lawgiver, but also as the personification of equality. He, cried the Marquise, Napoleon, the type of equality, for mercy's sake, then what would you call Robespierre? Come, come, do not strip the latter of his just rights to bestow them on the Corsican, who, to my mind, has usurped quite enough. Nay, madame, I would place each of these heroes on his right pedestal, that of Robespierre on his scaffold in the Place Louis Cans, that of Napoleon on the column of the Place Vendôme. The only difference consists in the opposite character of the equality advocated by these two men. One is the equality that elevates. The other is the equality that degrades. One brings a king within the reach of the guillotine. The other elevates the people to a level with the throne. Observe, said Villefort, smiling. I do not mean to deny that both these men were revolutionary scoundrels, and that the ninth Thermidor and the fourth of April in the year 1814 were lucky days for France, worthy of being gratefully remembered by every friend to the monarchy and civil order. And that explains how it comes to pass that, fallen as I trust he is forever, Napoleon has still retained a train of parasitical satellites. Still, Marquise, it has been so with other usurpers. Cromwell, for instance, who was not half so bad as Napoleon, had his partisans and advocates. Do you know, Villefort, that you are talking in the most dreadfully revolutionary strain? But I excuse it. It is impossible to expect the son of a Girondin to be free from a small spice of the old leaven. 
a deep crimson suffused the countenance of Will Four. "'Tis true, madame,' answered he, "'that my father was a Girondin. "'But he was not among the number of those "'who voted for the king's death. "'He was an equal sufferer with yourself "'during the reign of terror, "'and had well nigh lost his head "'on the same scaffold on which your father perished.' True, replied the Marquise, without wincing in the slightest degree at the tragic remembrance thus called up. But bear in mind, if you please, that our respective parents underwent persecution and proscription from diametrically opposite principles. In proof of which I may remark that while my family remained among the staunchest adherents of the exiled princess, your father lost no time in joining the new government, and that while the citizen Nortier was a Girondin, the Count Noirtier became a senator. Dear mother, interposed René, you know very well, it was agreed that all these disagreeable reminiscences should forever be laid aside. Suffer me also, madame, replied Villefort, to add my earnest request to Mademoiselle de saint merance that you will kindly allow the veil of oblivion to cover and conceal the past. What avails recrimination of a matter's wholly past recall? For my own part, I have laid aside even the name of my father, and altogether disown his political principles. He was, nay, probably may still be, a Bonapartist, and is called Noirtier. I, on the contrary, am a staunch royalist, and style myself the Villefort. Let what may remain of revolutionary sap exhaust itself and die away with the old trunk, and condescend only to regard the young shoot, which has started up at a distance from the parent tree, without having the power, any more than the wish, to separate entirely from the stock from which it sprung. Bravo, Villefort, cried the Marquis. Excellently well said. Come now, I have hopes of obtaining what I have been for years endeavouring to persuade the Marquise to promise, namely a perfect amnesty and forgetfulness of the past. With all my heart, replied the Marquise. Let the past be forever forgotten. I promise you it affords me as little pleasure to revive it as it does you. All I ask is that Villefort will be firm and inflexible for the future in his political principles. Remember also, Villefort, that we have pledged ourselves to His Majesty for your fealty and strict loyalty and that at our recommendation the king consented to forget the past, as I do. And here she extended to him her hand, as I now do at your entreaty. But bear in mind that should there fall in your way anyone guilty of conspiring against the government, you will be so much the more bound to visit the offence with rigorous punishment. As it is known, you belong to a suspected family. Alas, madame, returned Villefort, my profession, as well as the times in which we live, compels me to be severe. I have already successfully conducted several public prosecutions, and brought the offenders to merited punishment. But we have not done with the thing yet. Do you indeed think so? inquired the Marquise. I am at least fearful of it. Napoleon in the island of Elba is too near France, and his proximity keeps up the hopes of his partisans. 
Marseille is filled with half-pay officers who are daily, under one frivolous pretext or other, getting up quarrels with the royalists. From hence arise continual and fatal duels among the higher classes of persons, and assassinations in the lower. You have heard, perhaps, said the Comte de Sauvier, one of Monsieur de saint Meran's oldest friends, and Chamberlain to the Comte d'Artois, that the Holy Alliance purpose removing him from thence. Yes, they were talking about it when we left Paris, said Monsieur de saint Meran. And where is it decided to transfer him? To St. Helena. For heaven's sake, where is that? asked the Marquise. An island situated on the other side of the equator, at least two thousand leagues from here, replied the Count. So much the better. As Villefort observes, it is a great act of folly to have left such a man between Corsica, where he was born, and Naples, of which his brother-in-law is king, and face to face with Italy, the sovereignty of which he coveted for his son. Unfortunately, said Villefort, there are the treaties of 1814, and we cannot molest Napoleon without breaking those compacts. Oh, well, we shall find some way out of it, responded Monsieur de Salvier. There wasn't any trouble over treaties when it was a question of shooting the poor Duke Donquien. Well, said the Marquise, it seems probable that, by the aid of the Holy Alliance, we shall be rid of Napoleon, and we must trust to the vigilance of Monsieur de Villefort to purify Marseille of his partisans. The king is either a king or no king. If he be acknowledged as sovereign of France, he should be upheld in peace and tranquillity and this can best be effected by employing the most inflexible agents to put down every attempt at conspiracy. Tis the best and surest means of preventing mischief. Unfortunately, madame, answered Villefort, the strong arm of the law is not called upon to interfere until the evil has taken place. Then all he has got to do is to endeavor to repair it. Nay, madame, the law is frequently powerless to effect this. All it can do is to avenge the wrong done. Oh, Monsieur de Villefort, cried the beautiful young creature, daughter to the Comte de Salvier, and the cherished friend of Mademoiselle de saint Meran. Do try and get up some famous trial while we are at Marseille. I never was in a law court. I am told it is so very amusing. Amusing? Certainly, replied the young man, inasmuch as, instead of shedding tears, as at the fictitious tale of woe produced at a theatre, you behold in the law court a case of real and genuine distress, a drama of life. The prisoner whom you dare see pale agitated and alarmed, instead of, as is the case when a curtain falls on a tragedy, going home to sup peacefully with his family, and then retiring to rest, that he may recommence his mimic woes on the morrow, is removed from your sight merely to be reconducted to his prison, and delivered up to the executioner. I leave you to judge how far your nerves are calculated to bear you through such a scene. Of this, however, be assured, that should any favorable opportunity present itself, I will not fail to offer you the choice of being present. For shame, Monsieur de Villefort, said René, becoming quite pale. Don't you see how you are frightening us? And yet you laugh. What would you have? Tis like a duel. I have already recorded sentence of death five or six times against the movers of political conspiracies, 
And who can say how many daggers may be already sharpened, and only waiting a favorable opportunity to be buried in my heart? Gracious heavens, Monsieur de Villefort, said René, becoming more and more terrified. You surely are not in earnest. I am indeed, replied the young magistrate with a smile and in the interesting trial that young lady is anxious to witness, the case would only be still more aggravated. Suppose, for instance, the prisoner, as is more than probable, to have served under Napoleon. Well, can you expect for an instant that one accustomed, at the word of his commander, to rush fearlessly on the very bayonets of his foe, will scruple more to drive a stiletto into the heart of one he knows to be his personal enemy than to slaughter his fellow creatures merely because bidden to do so by one he is bound to obey besides one requires the excitement of being hateful in the eyes of the accused in order to lash one's self into a state of sufficient vehemence and power I would not choose to see the man against whom I pleaded smile, as though in mockery of my words. No, my pride is to see the accused pale, agitated, and as though beaten out of all composure by the fire of my eloquence. René uttered a smothered exclamation. Bravo! cried one of the guests, that is what I call talking to some purpose. Just the person we require at a time like the present, said a second. What a splendid business that last case of yours was, my dear Villefort, remarked a third. I mean the trial of the man for murdering his father. Upon my word, you killed him, ere the executioner had laid his hand upon him. Oh, as for parasites, and such dreadful people as that, interposed René, it matters very little what is done to them. But as regards poor unfortunate creatures, whose only crime consists in having mixed themselves up in political intrigues, why, that is the very worst offence they could possibly commit, for... Don't you see, René, the king is the father of his people, and he who shall plot or contrive ought against the life and safety of the parent of thirty-two million of souls, is parasite upon a fearfully great scale. I don't know anything about that, replied René. But, Monsieur de Villefort, you have promised me, have you not, always to show mercy to those I plead for? Make yourself quite easy on that point, answered Villefort, with one of his sweetest smiles. You and I will always consult upon our verdicts. My love, said the Marquise, attend to your doves, your lapdogs, and embroidery, but do not meddle with what you do not understand. Nowadays the military profession is in abeyance, and the magisterial robe is the badge of honor. There is a wise Latin proverb that is very much in point. Sedent arma toge, said Wilfour with a bow. I cannot speak Latin, responded the Marquise. Said René, I cannot help regretting you had not chosen some other profession than your own, a physician, for instance. Do you know I always felt a shudder at the idea of even a destroying angel? Dear good René, whispered Villefort as he gazed with unutterable tenderness on the lovely speaker. Let us hope, my child, cried the Marquis, that Monsieur de Villefort may prove the moral and political physician of this province. If so, he will have achieved a noble work and one which will go far to efface the recollection of his father's conduct, added the incorrigible Marquise. Madame, replied Villefort, with a mournful smile, I have already had the honor to observe that my father has, 
at least I hope so, abjured his past errors, and that he is, at the present moment, a firm and zealous friend to religion and order, a better royalist, possibly, than his son, for he has to atone for past dereliction, while I have no other impulse than warm, decided preference and conviction. Having made this well-turned speech, Villefort looked carefully around to mark the effect of his oratory. Much as he would have done had he been addressing the bench in open court. Do you know, my dear Villefort, cried the Comte de Salvier, that is exactly what I myself said the other day at the Tuileries when questioned by his majesty's principal chamberlain touching the singularity of an alliance between the son of a Girondin and the daughter of an officer of the Duc de Conte, and I assure you he seemed fully to comprehend that this mode of reconciling political differences was based upon sound and excellent principles. Then the king, who, without our suspecting it, had overheard our conversation, interrupted us by saying, Villefort, observed that the king did not pronounce the word Noirtier, but on the contrary placed considerable emphasis on that of Villefort. Villefort, said his majesty, is a young man of great judgment and discretion, who will be sure to make a figure in his profession. I like him much, and it gave me great pleasure to hear that he was about to become the son-in-law of the Marquis and the Marquise de saint merin I should myself have recommended the match, had not the noble Marquis anticipated my wishes by requesting my consent to it. Is it possible the king could have condescended so far as to express himself so favorably of me? asked the entraptured Villefort. I give you his very words, and if the Marquis chooses to be candid, he will confess that they perfectly agree with what His Majesty said to him, when he went six months ago to consult him upon the subject of your espousing his daughter. Uh, that is true, answered the Marquis. How much do I owe this gracious prince? What is there I would not do to evince my earnest gratitude? That is right, cried the Marquise. I love to see you thus. Now then, were a conspirator to fall into your hands, he would be most welcome. For my part, dear mother, in the post René, I trust your wishes will not prosper and that providence will only permit petty offenders, poor debtors, and miserable cheats to fall into Monsieur de Villefort's hands. Then I shall be contented. Just the same as though you prayed that a physician might only be called upon to prescribe for headaches, measles, and the stings of wasps, or any other slight affection of the epidermis. If you wish to see me the king's attorney, you must desire for me some of those violent and dangerous diseases, from the cure of which so much honor rebounds to the physician. At this moment, and as though the utterance of Villefort's wish had sufficed to effect its accomplishment, a servant entered the room and whispered a few words into his ear. Villefort immediately rose from table and quitted the room upon the plea of urgent business. He soon, however, returned, his whole face beaming with delight. René regarded him with fond affection. And certainly his handsome features, lit up as they then were, with more than usual fire and animation, seemed formed to excite the innocent admiration with which she gazed on her graceful and intelligent lover. You were wishing just now, said Villefort, addressing her, that I were a doctor instead of a lawyer. Well, I at least resemble the disciples of Esculapius in one thing. 
people spoke in this style in 1815, that of not being able to call a day my own, not even that of my betrothal. And wherefore were you called away just now? asked Mademoiselle de saint Marin, with an air of deep interest. For a very serious matter, which bids fair to make work for the executioner. How dreadful! exclaimed René, turning pale. Is it possible? burst simultaneously from all who were near enough to the magistrate to hear his words. Why, if my information prove correct, a sort of Bonapartist conspiracy has just been discovered. Can I believe my ears? cried the Marquise. I will read you the letter containing the accusation at least, said Lefort. The king's attorney is informed by a friend to the throne and the religious institutions of his country that one named Edmund Dante, mate of the ship Pharaon, this day arrived from Smyrna, after having touched at Naples and Porto Ferrajo, has been the bearer of a letter from Murat to the usurper, and again taken charge of another letter from the usurper to the Bonapartist club in Paris. Ample corroboration of this statement may be obtained by arresting the above-mentioned Edmond Dante, who either carries the letter for Paris about with him, or has it at his father's abode. Should it not be found in the possession of father or son, then it will assuredly be discovered in the cabin belonging to the said Dante on board the Pharaon. But, said René, this letter which, after all, is but an anonymous scrawl, is not even addressed to you, but to the king's attorney. True, but that gentleman being absent, his secretary, by his orders, opened his letters, thinking this one of importance. He sent for me, but not finding me, took upon himself to give the necessary orders for arresting the accused party. Then the guilty person is absolutely in custody, said the Marquise. Nay, dear mother, say the accused person. You know we cannot yet pronounce him guilty. He is in safe custody, answered Wilfour, and rely upon it, if the letter is found, he will not be likely to be trusted aboard again, unless he goes forth under the special protection of the headsman. And where is the unfortunate being? asked René. He's at my house. Come, come, my friend, interrupted the Marquise. Do not neglect your duty to linger with us. You are the king's servant and must go wherever that service calls you. Oh, will four, cried René, clasping her hands and looking towards her lover with piteous earnestness. Be merciful on this the day of our betrothal. The young man passed round to the side of the table where the fair pleader sat, and leaning over the chair, said tenderly, To give you pleasure, my sweet René, I promised to show all the lenity in my power. But if the charges brought against this Bonapartist hero prove correct, why? then you really must give me leave to order his head to be cut off. René shuddered at the word cut, for the growth in question had a head. And never mind that foolish girl, Villefort, said the Marquise. She will soon get over these things. So saying, Madame de saint Meran extended her dry, bony hand to Villefort who, while imprinting a son-in-law's respectful salute on it, looked at René as much as to say, I must try and fancy, tis your dear hand, I kiss, as it should have been. These are mournful auspices to accompany a betrothal, sighed poor René. Upon my word, child, exclaimed the angry Marquise, your folly exceeds all bounds. I should be glad to know what connection there can possibly be between your sickly sentimentality and the affairs of the state. Oh, mother, murmured René. Nay, madame, 
I pray you pardon this little traitor. I promise you that, to make up for her want of loyalty, I will be most inflexibly severe. Then, casting an expressive glance at his betrothed, which seemed to say, Fear not, for your dear sake my justice shall be tempered with mercy. And receiving a sweet and approving smile in return, Villefort departed with paradise in his heart. Chapter 7 The Examination no sooner had Villefort left the salon than he assumed the grave air of a man who holds the balance of life and death in his hands. Now, in spite of the nobility of his countenance, the command of which, like a finished actor, he had carefully studied before the glass, it was by no means easy for him to assume an air of judicial severity. Except the recollection of the line of politics his father had adopted, and which might interfere unless he acted with the greatest prudence. With his own career, Gerard de Villefort was as happy as a man could be. Already rich, he held a high official situation, although only twenty-seven. He was about to marry a young and charming woman whom he loved, not passionately, but reasonably, as became a deputy attorney of the king. And besides her personal attractions, which were very great, Mademoiselle de saint Meran's family possessed considerable political influence, which they would, of course, exert in his favor. The dowry of his wife amounted to fifty thousand crowns, and he had, besides, the prospect of seeing her fortune increased to half a million at her father's death. These considerations naturally gave Villefort a feeling of such complete felicity that his mind was fairly dazzled in its contemplation. At the door he met the commissionary of police, who was waiting for him. In the sight of this officer, recalled Villefort from the third heaven to earth. He composed his face, as we have before described, and said, I have read the letter, sir, and you have acted rightly in arresting this man. Now inform me what you have discovered concerning him and the conspiracy. We know nothing as yet of the conspiracy, monsieur. All the papers found have been sealed up and placed on your desk. The prisoner himself is named Edmond Dante, a mate on board the Three Master, the Pharaon, trading in cotton with Alexandria and Smyrna, and belonging to Morel and Son of Marseille. Before he entered the merchant service, had he ever served in the Marines? Oh, no, monsieur, he is very young. How old? Nineteen or twenty at the most. At this moment, and as Villefort had arrived at the corner of Rue de Conseil, a man, who seemed to have been waiting for him, approached. It was Monsieur Morel. Ah, Monsieur de Villefort, cried he, I am delighted to see you. Some of your people have committed the strangest mistake. They have just arrested Edmond Dante, mate of my vessel. I know it, monsieur, replied Villefort, and I am now going to examine him. Oh, said Morel, carried away by his friendship, you do not know him, and I do. He is the most estimable, the most trustworthy creature in the world, and I venture to say there is not a better seaman in all the merchant service. Oh, Monsieur de Villefort, I beseech your indulgence for him. Villefort, as we have seen, belonged to the aristocratic party at Marseilles. Morel to the plebeian. The first was a royalist, the other suspected of Bonapartism. 
Villefort looked disdainfully at Morel and replied coldly, You are aware, monsieur, that a man may be estimable and trustworthy in private life, and the best seaman in the merchant service, and yet be, politically speaking, a great criminal. Is it not true? The magistrate laid emphasis on these words, as if he wished to apply them to the owner himself. While his eyes seemed to plunge into the heart of one who, interceding for another, had himself need of indulgence. Morel reddened, for his own conscience was not quite clear on politics. Besides, what Dante had told him of his interview with the Grand Marshal, and what the Emperor had said to him, embarrassed him. He replied, however, in a tone of deep interest. I entreated you, Monsieur de Villefort, be, as you always are, kind and equitable, and give him back to us soon. This give us sounded revolutionary in the deputy's ears. Ah, ah, murmured he, is Dante then a member of some carbonari society, that his protector thus employs the collective form? He was, if I recollect, arrested in a tavern, in company with a great many others. Then he added, Monsieur, you may rest assured I shall perform my duty impartially, and that if he be innocent you shall not have appealed to me in vain. Should he, however, be guilty in this present epoch, impunity would furnish a dangerous example and I must do my duty. As he had now arrived at the door of his own house, which adjoined the Palais de Justice, he entered, after having coldly saluted the ship-owner, who stood as if petrified on the spot where Villefort had left him. The antechamber was full of police agents and gendarmes, in the midst of whom, carefully watched, but calm and smiling, stood the prisoner. Wilford traversed the antechamber, cast a side glance at Dante, and, taking a packet which a gendarme offered him, disappeared, saying, Bring in the prisoner. Rapid as had been Wilford's glance, it had served to give him an idea of the man he was about to interrogate. He had recognized intelligence in the high forehead, and courage in the dark eye and bent brow, and frankness in the thick lips that showed a set of pearly teeth. Villefort's first impression was favorable, but he had been so often warned to mistrust first impulses that he applied the maxim to the impression, forgetting the difference between the two words. He stifled, therefore, the feelings of compassion that were rising, composed his features, and sat down, grim and sober, at his desk. An instant after, Dante entered. He was pale, but calm and collected, and saluting his judge with easy politeness, looked round for a seat as if he had been in Monsieur Morel's salon. It was then that he encountered for the first time Villefort's look, that look peculiar to the magistrate, who, while seeming to read the thoughts of others, betrays nothing of his own. Who and what are you? demanded Villefort, turning over a pile of papers, containing information relative to the prisoner that the police agent had given to him on his entry, and that, already, in an hour's time, had swelled to voluminous proportions. Thanks to the corrupt espionage of which the accused is always made the victim. My name is Edmond Dante, replied the young man calmly. I am mate of the pharaon, belonging to Messieurs Morel and Son. Your age, continued Villefort. Nineteen, returned Dante. 
What were you doing at the moment you were arrested? I was at the festival of my marriage, monsieur, said the young man, his voice slightly tremulous. So great was the contrast between that happy moment and the painful ceremony he was now undergoing. So great was the contrast between the somber aspect of Monsieur de Villefort and the radiant face of Mercedes. You were at the festival of your marriage, said the deputy, shuddering in spite of himself. Yes, monsieur, I am on the point of marrying a young girl I have been attached to for three years. Villefort, impassive as he was, was struck with this coincidence, and the tremulous voice of Dante, surprised in the midst of his happiness, struck a sympathetic chord in his own bosom. He also was on the point of being married, and he was summoned from his own happiness to destroy that of another. This philosophic reflection, thought he, will make a great sensation at Monsieur de Saint-Marin's, and he arranged mentally, while Dante awaited further questions, the antithesis by which orators often create a reputation for eloquence. When this speech was arranged, Villefort turned to Dante. Go on, sir, said he. What would you have me say? Give all the information in your power. Tell me on which point you desire information, and I will tell all I know. Only, added he with a smile, I warn you, I know very little. Have you served under the usurper? I was about to be mustered into the Royal Marines when he fell. It is reported your political opinions are extreme, said Villefort, who had never heard anything of the kind but was not sorry to make this inquiry, as if it were an accusation. "'My political opinions,' replied Dante. "'Alas, sir, I never had any opinions. I am hardly nineteen. I know nothing. I have no part to play. If I obtain the situation I desire, I shall owe it to Monsieur Morel. Thus all my opinions, I will not say public, but private, are confined to these three sentiments. I love my father, I respect Monsieur Morel, and I adore Mercedes. This, sir, is all I can tell you, and you see how uninteresting it is. As Dante spoke, Villefort gazed at his ingenious and open countenance, and recollected the words of René, who, without knowing who the culprit was, had besought his indulgence for him. With the deputy's knowledge of crime and criminals, every word the young man uttered convinced him more and more of his innocence. This lad, for he was scarcely a man, simple, natural, eloquent with eloquence of the heart never found when sought for, full of affection for everybody because he was happy, and because happiness renders even the wicked good, extended his affection even to his judge, spite of Villefort's severe look and stern accent. Dante seemed full of kindness. Pardieu, said Villefort, he is a noble fellow. I hope I shall gain Renée's favor easily by obeying the first command she ever imposed on me. I shall have at least a pressure of the hand in public, and a sweet kiss in private. Full of this idea, Villefort's face became so joyous that when he turned to Dante, the latter, who had watched the change of his physiognomy, was smiling also. Sir, said Villefort, have you any enemies, at least that you know of? I have enemies, replied Dante. My position is not sufficiently elevated for that. As for my disposition, that is, perhaps, somewhat too hasty, but I have striven to repress it. I have had ten or twelve sailors under me, and if you question them, they will tell you that they love and respect me, not as a father, for I am too young, 
but as an elder brother. But you may have excited jealousy. You are about to become captain at nineteen. An elevated post. You are about to marry a pretty girl who loves you. And these two pieces of good fortune may have excited the envy of someone. You are right. You know man better than I do. And what you say may possibly be the case. I confess. But if such persons are among my acquaintances, I prefer not to know it, because then I should be forced to hate them. You are wrong. You should always strive to see clearly around you. You seem a worthy young man. I will depart from the strict line of my duty to aid you in discovering the author of this accusation. Here is the paper. Do you know the writing? As he spoke, Villefort drew the letter from his pocket and presented it to Dante. Dante read it. A cloud passed over his brow as he said, No, monsieur, I do not know the writing, and yet it is tolerably plain. Whoever did it writes well. I am very fortunate, added he, looking gratefully at Villefort, to be examined by such a man as you for this envious person is a real enemy. And by the rapid glance that the young man's eye shot forth, Villefort saw how much energy lay hid beneath this mildness. Now, said the deputy, answer me frankly, not as a prisoner to a judge, but as a man to another who takes an interest in him. What truth is there in the accusation contained in this anonymous letter? And Villefort threw disdainfully on his desk the letter Dante had just given back to him. None at all. I will tell you the real facts. I swear by my honor as a sailor, by my love for Mercedes, by the life of my father. Speak, monsieur, said Villefort, then internally. If René could see me. I hope she would be satisfied, and would no longer call me a decapitator. Well, when we quitted Naples, Captain Leclerc was attacked by a brain fever, as we had no doctor on board, and he was so anxious to arrive at Elba, that he would not touch at any other port. His disorder rose to such a height, that at the end of the third day, feeling he was dying, he called me to him. My dear Dante, said he, swear to perform what I am going to tell you, for it is a matter of the deepest importance. I swear, Captain, replied I. Well, as after my death the command devolves on you as mate, assume the command and bear up for the island of Elba. Disembark at Porto Ferrajo. As for the Grand Marshal, give him this letter. Perhaps they will give you another letter, and charge you with a commission. You will accomplish what I was to have done, and derive all the honor and profit from it. I will do it, Captain, but perhaps I shall not be admitted to the Grand Marshal's presence as easily as you expect. Here is a ring that will obtain audience of him and remove every difficulty, said the captain. At these words he gave me a ring. It was time. Two hours after he was delirious. The next day he died. And what did you do then? What I ought to have done and what everyone would have done in my place. Everywhere the last requests of a dying man are sacred, but with a sailor the last requests of his superior are commands. I sailed for the island of Elba, where I arrived the next day. I ordered everybody to remain on board, and went on shore alone. As I had expected, I found some difficulty in obtaining access to the Grand Marshal but I sent the ring I had received from the captain to him, and was instantly admitted. He questioned me concerning Captain Leclerc's death, and, as the letter had told me, gave me a letter to carry on to a person in Paris. I undertook it because it was what my captain had paid me to do. 
I landed here, regulated the affairs of the vessel, and hastened to visit my affianced bride, whom I found more lovely than ever. Thanks to Monsieur Morel, all the forms were got over. In a word, I was, as I told you, at my marriage feast, and I should have been married in an hour, and tomorrow I intended to start for Paris. Had I not been arrested on this charge, which you, as well as I, now see to be unjust. Ah, said Lefort, this seems to me the truth. If you have been culpable, it was imprudence, and this imprudence was in obedience to the orders of your captain. Give up this letter you have brought from Elba, and pass your word you will appear should you be required and go and rejoin your friends. I am free then, sir, cried Dante joyfully. Yes, but first give me this letter. You have it already, for it was taken from me with some others, which I see in that packet. Stop a moment, said the deputy, as Dante took his hat and gloves. To whom is it addressed? To Monsieur Nortier, Rue Coqueron. Paris. Had a thunderbolt fallen into the room, Villefort could not have been more stupefied. He sank into his seat, and hastily turning over the packet, drew forth the fatal letter, at which he glanced with an expression of terror. Monsieur Nortier, Rue Coqueron, number 13, murmured he, growing still paler. Yes, said Dante, do you know him? No, replied Villefort. A faithful servant of the king does not know conspirators. It is a conspiracy, then, asked Dante, who, after believing himself free, now began to feel a tenfold alarm. I have, however, already told you, sir, I was entirely ignorant of the contents of the letter. Yes, but you knew the name of the person to whom it was addressed, said Villefort. I was forced to read the address, to know to whom to give it. Have you shown this letter to anyone? asked Villefort, becoming still more pale. To no one, on my honor. Everybody is ignorant that you are the bearer of a letter from the island of Elba and addressed to Monsieur Noirtier. Everybody except the person who gave it to me. And that was too much, far too much, murmured Villefort. Villefort's brow darkened more and more, while white lips and clenched teeth filled Dante's with apprehension. After reading the letter, Villefort covered his face with his hands. Oh, said Dante timidly. What is the matter? Villefort made no answer, but raised his head at the expiration of a few seconds, and again perused the letter. And you say that you are ignorant of the contents of this letter? I give you my word of honor, sir, said Dante. But what is the matter? Are you ill? Shall I ring for assistance? Shall I call? No said Villefort, rising hastily. Stay where you are. It is for me to give orders here, and not you. Monsieur, replied Dante proudly, it was only to summon assistance for you. I want none. It was a temporary indisposition. Attend to yourself. Answer me. Dante waited, expecting a question, but in vain. Villefort fell back on his chair, passed his hand over his brow, moistened with perspiration, and for the third time read the letter. Oh, if he knows the contents of this, murmured he, and that Noirtier is the father of Villefort, I am lost. And he fixed his eyes upon Edmund as if he would have penetrated his thoughts. Oh, it is impossible to doubt it, cried he suddenly. In heaven's name, cried the unhappy young man, if you doubt me, question me, I will answer you. 
Villefort made a violent effort, and in a tone he strove to render firm. Sir, said he, I am no longer able, as I had hoped, to restore you immediately to your liberty. Before doing so, I must consult the trial justice. What my own feeling is, you already know. Oh, monsieur, cried Dante, you have been rather a friend than a judge. Well, I must detain you some time longer, but I will strive to make it as short as possible. The principal charge against you is this letter. And you see, Villefort approached the fire, cast it in, and waited until it was entirely consumed. You see, I destroy it. Oh, exclaimed Dante, you are goodness itself. Listen, continued Villefort, you can now have confidence in me after what I have done. Oh, command, and I will obey. Listen, this is not a command, but advice I give you. Speak, and I will follow your advice. I shall detain you until this evening in the Palais de Justice. Should anyone else interrogate you, say to him what you have said to me, but do not breathe the word of this letter. I promise, I promise. It was Wilfour who seemed to entreat, and the prisoner who reassured him. You see, continued he, glancing toward the grate, where fragments of burnt paper fluttered in the flames. The letter is destroyed. You and I alone know of its existence. Should you, therefore, be questioned, deny all knowledge of it. Deny it boldly, and you are saved. Be satisfied, I will deny it. It was the only letter you had. It was. Swear it. I swear. Will Four rang. A police agent entered. Wilfour whispered some words in his ear, to which the officer replied by a motion of his head. Follow him, said Wilfour to Dante. Dante saluted Wilfour and retired. Hardly had the door closed when Wilfour threw himself, half fainting, into a chair. Alas, alas, murmured he. If the procureur himself had been at Marseille, I should have been ruined. This accursed letter would have destroyed all my hopes. O oh, my father, must your past career always interfere with my successes? Suddenly a light passed over his face. A smile played round his set mouth, and his haggard eyes were fixed in thought. Thus will do, said he, and from this letter, which might have ruined me, I will make my fortune. Now to the work I have in hand. And after having assured himself that the prisoner was gone, the deputy procureur hastened to the house of his betrothed.